As Adam mentioned, uh, I am mixed, and I'm, a, I'm more than uh, just white and black. So I was hoping, because no one likes to talk about race, that uh, we do a little icebreaker, and I thought about that uh, this morning. I was going to ask someone in the audience to guess the rest of my, you know, the fillers in between in my ethnicity. But then I was like, I don't want to put someone on the spot. So I figure, if I count to three, all of us just shout ideas of what my ethnic makeup is together. We'll do it all together. All right, so I'll give you a second here. I'll stand right here. Just look at me. All right. We're going to do it together on three. One, two, three. <laughs> Puerto Rican. <laughs> That's amazing. I don't know what you guys said. That was awesome. I just wanted to hear what happened. Uh, so as Adam mentioned, this is my father. He's white. Uh, he doesn't look like this now. This is many years ago. Uh, it's my mother. She's African American. There's me, healthy combination of the two. Uh, my parents had me when they were about 20 years old. They were in a punk band together. <laughs> my dad was a uh, guitar player. My mother was the singer. So uh, needless to say, people didn't know what to make of my family, uh, let alone what to make of me. Uh, people thought I was a weird black kid who listened to punk music. Some thought I was a really tan white guy. Uh, Others, uh, depending on what my hairstyle was doing, thought I was either Hawaiian, Mexican, or something. Literally, people would come up to me and say, what's your ethnicity? I know you're something. I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> growing up, uh, I've been called uh, spick. I've been called a dirty Arab. I've been called the N-word, sometimes maliciously, sometimes because they thought I was a really tan white guy, and they felt comfortable saying that in front of me. Um, but needless to say, I was always looking for my place in the world, and oftentimes I would look for it in cinema. My dad was a big movie buff, and uh, I was an only child, so I watched a lot of movies, watched a lot of television, and uh, no surprise, I became a filmmaker. To me, uh, film, um, when it's at its best, it's an exploration of emotion, exploration of the human condition, it's an exploration of life. Uh, it allows us to, has the power to teach us to empathize and, and feel a sense of compassion for other cultures or other people's experiences. And also, like most art forms, uh, it becomes a record of our collective story or a reflection of our collective story. So when I was a kid, I watched it primarily for entertainment, but I was always looking for a reflection of myself, and I never saw it. Recently, I was at a wedding in the Bay Area, and there was this couple who kind of took a liking to me, specifically the husband, because he found out that I directed this film called Undefeated. And he really, apparently, really loved that film. Loved it so much to the point where every time he saw me over the course of the three-day weekend, he would just find me, raise his, hit, his fist in the air, and say, Undefeated! <laughs> hey! I didn't, know what that, I didn't know what that meant. Uh, but... Uh, this gentleman was, you know, he was tall, uh, white, uh, father of two, uh, mid-30s. Uh, the evening of the actual wedding, he got really drunk and came up to me with a high five saying, hey, man, I don't want to offend you or anything, but what are you? And I was like, I don't, what does that mean? What are you? Uh, <laughs> and uh, he said, no, no, like, what's your, ethnic, what's your ethnicity or your nationality or whatever? So usually I don't like to talk about race with drunk white guys at weddings. <laughs> But uh, I, I, uh, I entertained it anyways, and I, so I told him. And I was like, on my father's side, I'm Scandinavian and Jewish, and on my mom's side, I'm African American, Chinese, and Native American. And he sat there for a sec with his eyes wide open. He pointed at me and said, you're the future. And I was like, thank you. I, I don't know what I was supposed to say to that. Um, but uh, the conversation, he actually started calling me the future over the course of the entire night after that. So I went from undefeated to the future. Uh, not too bad. Uh, but that conversation uh, actually inspired me to actually look at what my actual ethnic makeup was. So I did 23andMe. So apparently I lied to him. I've been lying to people for many, many years. Uh, I wasn't that far off. Uh, I'm about 22% uh, broadly Northern European. I don't know what that means. Uh, about 24% Ashkenazi Jewish, about 40% Sub-Saharan African, 
and about only 2% uh, Asian and Native American. When I was in elementary school, uh, you know, when you register for school, you register your ethnicity for the, for the school demographics. And my dad was so proud of my mixed, mixed background. He's like, we can, you can be anything. What do you want to be? And I was like, I don't know. He was like, how about Chinese? And I was like, yeah, Chinese. So from, from elementary school all the way through high school, I was registered as Chinese <laughs> on my school uh, demographics. So back to the idea of me being the future. The more I thought about what this drunken gentleman said, the more I realized he's actually right. So word on the street is that by the year 2050, there will be a uh, tipping point in the United States where there will be more people of color than there will be white people or European American. Um, right now, we're sitting around 63% white, 37% people of color. When I say people of color, that's including all other ethnicities, Latino, African American, Asian, Pacific Islander. Um, and by the year 2050, uh, we should be sitting around uh, 47, 46, 47% white and about 54, 53% people of color. Now, the dominant group will be uh, Latino, but the fastest growing group of that 54% are mixed race, people like me. One in six new marriages are interracial. So as a filmmaker, this begged the question, if this is the trajectory of our country, why do we not see a more accurate reflection of our cultural aesthetic? And are we not robbing ourselves of a rich, collective, cultural narrative by not celebrating a broader, a more broad, diverse stories? So it certainly wasn't a thought that I hadn't had before, but it made me look at my own experiences. Uh, in 2009, I moved to Memphis to shoot uh, uh, my film Undefeated with my uh, filmmaking partner and our producer. Uh, the film is about, a, we, we profile the lives of a high school football team in North Memphis, which is a poverty-stricken community, uh, predominantly African-American. We were there for nine months. Uh, we then went back to Los Angeles to cut the film for about another nine months. And we cut it for about another year. And then in 2011, we premiered the film at the South by Southwest Film Festival, where it was acquired by the Weinstein Company. And then in 2012, we won the, award, the Academy Award for Best Feature Length Documentary. <laughs> yeah. starting to blush, but you can't see it because I'm a tan white guy. <laughs> uh, making me, uh, this is a weird segue, making me the first African American to win an Oscar for directing a feature length film. So this was received with a lot of different reactions uh, from individuals and publications across all uh, racial lines. There were some that, th uh, that were ready to claim me and celebrate the milestone in the African American community. There were some that were, uh, didn't think it was right because I wasn't black enough. I, I don't know what that means. And then there were some who were like, really, you're black? <laughs> uh, that was probably the more common response to the experience. But what it made me realize was that how novel it still is, the idea of being mixed race, how difficult it is for people to digest it. So it was always really important for me to be very vocal about it when I was doing press to talk about what my ethnic background is. For one, because that's my experience. Uh, that is my ethnicity. Two is the idea of double consciousness, which is a term or a theory that was popularized by W.B. Du Bois, which speaks to how we shape our identity. The struggle of seeing yourself through your own lens combined with the struggle of seeing yourself through the lens of society. So I could never say, yes, I am the first African-American director to win an Oscar for a feature-length film. Because simply put, that's not my experience. My experience of navigating the world is that of a mixed person with a black parent and a white parent, which is night and day different than navigating the world if both your parents are black. I can never escape the way in which society views me. So I'd always tell people, you know, if you want to celebrate my African American uh, heritage, then you also have to celebrate the other half. So after the success of Undefeated, my filmmaking partner and I decided we wanted to do a scripted film next. And we read many, many scripts. Um, the last two or three years, we probably read between 250 to 300 scripts. Um, a lot of like mainstream kind of studio stuff. But uh, it wasn't until my recent run-in with the drunk gentleman at the wedding that I realized all these scripts had something in common. 
And you know, when you read a script, when you meet a new character, there are descriptors. So like, you know, black, short, tall, long hair, short hair, whatever. Um, and what I found fascinating, out of all these scripts, 300 or so, not one of them described the ethnicity of the main character or the hero of the film or the story. So the optimist in me says, well, maybe the writer wanted to keep it open-ended so that the reader places themselves in the character's shoes. The filmmaker in me says, well, that's bad storytelling. My directing partner and I always talk about the idea that specificity kills cliche. Essentially, that specificity of character, specificity in time, specificity of place is what elevates your story. So it begged the thought, at least for me, is our collective, our cultural collective default when we go into thinking about a story somewhere back in our, in our psyche from conditioning, is it to experience it through the lens of a white male? And as I was wrestling with these ideas, I decided to rent a movie and I went to iTunes. And I started noticing a pattern. So, to me, what I see is a very monocular world. Stories primarily told through one perspective, that of white male. And given the trajectory of our country, that felt really imbalanced. And it made me feel like a kid again. Where is a reflection of myself? And at what point am I going to stop being a supporting act or a supporting character to someone else's story? So recently, uh, the Directors Guild of America released some statistics on uh, uh, the demographics of directors who directed episodic television. And they found that 82% of episodic television this last year was directed by uh, Caucasians. And 19% was directed by minorities. So in that 19%, let's not forget, 19% includes Asian American, Latino, African American, Pacific Island. I mean, that's a lot of cultures in a little sliver of 19%. I also found a report that um, UCLA did on, uh, uh, they did a Hollywood and diversity report. And they found that only 10.5% of lead actors in theatrical films were minorities. Only 5.1% of lead actors in broadcast comedies and, and dramas were minority. And only 12.2% of directors in theatrical films were minority in 2014. To take it a step further, the ratio of men and women into the director chair is 12 to 1, meaning every 100 films or so you see, about eight are directed by a woman. Which then begs the question, when did creativity become gender specific? So in, in doing this research, it reminded me of a question that a journalist once asked me, which is, what's missing in African American cinema? And I told her, I, part of the problem is inherent in the question. To me, cinema has become too compartmentalized. Black cinemas for blacks, Latino cinemas for Latinos, et cetera, et cetera. And it leads down a sense, down a path of ethnocentrism, which is not necessarily a bad thing because usually it comes from a place of pride. However, I don't think it should be the de facto rule. If we, go to, if we become too ethnocentric, we start becoming too exclusive and not inclusive. So if the future of the country is gonna look more like me or like them, then it seems to me we should be more inclusive and broaden the scope of our storytelling. It doesn't mean that every film needs to be about race. It just means we need to recognize that we have a diverse array of experiences that ultimately make up the American landscape and the American identity and the American story. Together, I think we have a rich cultural identity. And to me, I think that can be one of our biggest assets. And I think it's up to us, a people, to start fostering that idea. Let's be curious about the diverse communities in our country, and not be fearful about them. Let's be curious about what life is like in a predominantly black neighborhood in North Memphis. Let's be curious about what life is like in predominantly Latino community in East LA. And once we start uh, uh, being proud of our collective narrative, and not just that of the individual, then maybe we can actually start seeing a more accurate reflection of ourselves in cinema and television. And hopefully, 30 years from now, there's not another kid who's sitting there asking themselves, when will I stop being a supporting character in someone else's story? Thank you.